Hello everyone and welcome to our second video lecture on Grasshopper. This time we're going to get more into the details of how to actually use the tools. We'll slow things down a bit so that you can follow along and play at home. And we're going to show you some tips and tricks to make sure that you can come up with some amazing surfaces for your assessment. Let's get stuck in. Okay, let's have a look at adding some complexities into our transform. So I've got a very simple box here in Rhino. Let's go ahead and bring that in. Go up to parameters and then geometry, right click, set one geometry inside there. So if we wanted to do a transform Euclidean move, now of course we can just move the box in this way. And then we know to use our vectors, vector X, Y, Z, to change the degree in which we're editing that. And then if we add a number slider, we can change one box and we can move that up and down and effectively makes a copy. But adding complexity into this gives us a lot more control and a lot more unique qualities which we can bring to our surface generation. So let's have a look at how we might use some maths to bring some more interest into there. So instead of changing one number coming to the Z quality, Let's see what happens if we add a series of number plugging into there instead. So we got our start, then let's make another one of these. We have our number, and then let's have a look at what's going on inside here. So we'll zoom out a little bit in Rhino, and we can see that rather than having just one come out of there, we have a bunch come out of there. And also because we're dealing with series, Remember, we can change how many points are along the way. And we've got other options in here as well. Instead of just series, we could do it randomly. We could make it follow the Fibonacci sequence. We can do it along a range. We can do whatever we want in there. And so you can see how plugging a series into the vector allows us to really manipulate what's going on inside here. All right, now let's have a look at how we can do some complex things with rotation. So I've got a set of boxes again. I've got my original geometry, which is plugged inside there. I've moved them up and I've created a series, uh, which changes as we go along. Same setup as we had just before. Now we want to play around with rotation. So again, we go up into transform, Euclidean, and we've got a few different options for rotation. I want to do rotate axis. So ask for a few things inside here. We need a geometry, we need an angle of rotation, and we need a rotation axis. So our geometry is going to be each one of these guys. And then obviously we haven't plugged anything in yet, so it's just rotating that way. Now I want to be very specific about our rotation angle. Now, of course, we can't just add numbers because it's looking for something relevant to pi, relevant to its circumference. So Grasshopper is smart enough to go from zero to pi to two pi or two times pi and create a number slider out of that. So we know pi to be the center point, 3.142, and we can plug that into our angle. So we can see that we're gonna get some rotations here coming out of our slider, which is a good start. And then finally, we need an axis of rotation. I don't actually want to go the current way it's going. I wanna set a new axis because I want them to rotate through the center. So if we go back into Rhino, I'm going to make a line then I'm going to go make sure my midpoint is turned on. I'm going to get midpoint here to midpoint there, get that intersection, go over to my right hand side, make sure we've got shift turned on. And then I know this is going to be our axis. So I've got a line on the inside of there. So of course we need to bring that into Grasshopper first, go back over to geometry, curve, set one curve, and let's bring that line in, and that will act as our axis of rotation. So if we do that again, we should see our boxes are now rotating. Once again, let's have some fun. Instead of plugging this straight into a pure rotation, let's see what happens when we add a series into that. So let's go back into sets, sequence, and remember you've got other ones to play with as well, random, range, Fibonacci, whatever. We're just going to experiment with series though. So what we want to do is instead of rotating all the boxes at the same degree, we want each box to have a different degree of rotation. So we're going to steal this guy over here. 
and bring that down there and another one inside here there you go disable that one for now we have our start our normal and then we want our count to be the same as the number of boxes so we can just grab this slider from over here in the previous series so that's going to be the same number of boxes and then we can plug that into our angle and we'll see as we rotate this through through our number of steps we're going to get different rotations depending on which different box we're in which is really really cool so we can mess around with that and experiment with that of course now something else that gets really interesting is we're currently dealing with one axis so everything's going to rotate along that one point if we go back into rhino and just play with the angle of this just a little bit in terms of our axis and then we go back into grasshopper change that step again let's see what happens all of a sudden we now have boxes who are rotating or spiraling around this different axis so all of a sudden it's like something out of Harry Potter these boxes flying through space like this really really interesting geometry so you can see how you could use something as simple as a rotation with a series or some randomness to create some really really powerful and interesting geometries for your surfaces okay for the last one let's have a look at how we can scale proportionally as well to the number so this time we're up in transform affine and then scale and then we can plug our geometries that came out of the rotations in that's not scaling anything yet because we need to define some factors. Of course, we want to scale in series because we want each one to be scaled proportionally. So I'm going to grab a series box that I've already got here. I'm going to disconnect these guys by pressing control, click, control, and click. I'm happy for the count to stay in though because we want the same number of boxes to be the same number of scale. So that one can stay inside there. Let's add a few number sliders. So this one is looking for a 0 to 1 to 10. And we'll plug that one into that one there. And then we're going to add another one inside here. Into there. And then let's go ahead and plug that into our scale factor. Okay, so we can see that that is now scaling our boxes proportionately and of course we can rotate those boxes so now we have a rotation of the boxes a scaling of the boxes and then the number of boxes here as well so we can decrease that we can increase that we can rotate it more we can increase the size more we have all of that control right here in these components that we've constructed all right, let's have a look at how we can use algorithms to help us with our transformations. I've got a little sphere here inside Rhino and I wanna do an array, which of course I could do easily in Rhino, but I wanna be able to edit each part of the array once we get down the line. So first thing we need to do, of course, is to bring this information into Rhino. So I've got my geometry, which I'm going to set as my little sphere. And then when I go to do my transform array, rectangular array I have my geometry but I need a rectangle to set the difference much like when we would be drawing an array in Rhino when we set our preview we draw a little rectangle to show what's going to be the x and y distance between the next points so I've already got a rectangle here to make my life easier so I'm going to bring that in as well just as a curve and set one curve and that is our rectangle inside there and we can see that now that we've plugged that in, it's going to use that rectangular geometry to set our array. After that, we want to tell Rhino how many points we want in each direction. So, of course, we're going to need a number slider, 5 to 10. Let's make another one of those. I'm going to plug one in for the X and another one in for the Y. And I want an even number for what I'm doing later. So I'm just going to adjust my Y count and make that set to 6. And so now we should see 5 times 6. We've got 30 in our array so far. So that's a nice little array. Next thing I want to do is to split this uh, set of spheres that we have here into groups. Effectively what I want to achieve is I want to be able to scale this group here 
differently to scaling this group here, differently to scaling this group here. So we can imagine if this was traveling along a surface and we want a bit of a gradient of scale, I want to be able to scale each one of these groups individually. So first thing we need to do, of course, is to break them into groups. So we go up into our sets, lists, and then partition lists. And then we're going to grab our geometry and then we need some more information, locally defined values. So this is the size of partitions, aka how many uh, items coming from this geometry do we want to add per group? So we've got 30 in here, five times six. So I wanna split three chunks, which means I need 10 per group. So I'm just gonna grab this slider over here. I believe the maximum is already set to 10. So there we go that's going into there and we can see we've now got chunks as a tree. Let's have a look at what that means when we talk about trees. So I'm just gonna chuck a panel in here and we can see that we have surfaces, zero to 10 or 10 of them in each one, uh, broken into three separate chunks. So we've got chunk one here is going to be these spheres, chunk two here is gonna be the next range of spheres and chunk three is gonna be the final chunk of spheres. That's good. We want to be able to deal with each one of those trees individually or each one of the branches of the trees individually. So we need to do something further to that. So we go back into our sets over to tree and then we need to explode our tree and that's going to make it possible for us to deal with each chunk at a time. We need to zoom in here to add one more row because we've got three groups and we can see that that turns it into a yellow so now we've broken each chunk. If we hover over these, we've got this one, 10 locally defined values, another 10 locally defined values here, and another 10 locally defined values here. All right, so we're gonna be scaling each part. So first thing we need to do is, because we wanna be scaling at the center point of each one of these geometries, we need to find those center points first. So I'm going to go up into my surface tools, analysis, and then I'm gonna get box properties. Then I'm gonna plug that one into there and I'm gonna need one for each of my branches as well. So let's go ahead and copy these down. So this one will go into that one, this one will go into that one, and then we see we now have one for each of these. So this is gonna give us our center points for each one of these spheres so that we know that when we're scaling, we're gonna scale each one relative to its center point. And then the next thing I wanna do is back up to transform, affine, scale, these are the geometries I want to scale, which is coming out of that tree. So I can take that. And then the center points that I want them to scale in, because see they're not currently scaling around their center points, is this one here, I go into center, and that's going to be scaling into there relative to a factor which we haven't defined yet. So let's add a number slider. I want zero goes to 0 0.05, actually no to 0 0.5, and then we go to maybe 3.0. All right, let's plug that into there. And let's see what happens when we get to three point. Great, we can see these spheres are coming out a lot bigger there now. And I'm gonna resize that down there. Okay, so of course we want to scale the other two groups as well. So let's quickly make a copy of these. Let me bring that down, holding our Alt key to bring those down. And we need to disconnect them from where they're currently plugged in or we can just overrule them. So I'm gonna plug this one I know is my geometries and my center points is coming out of this one. This one here is my geometries for the last set and my center points are coming out of this one here. So now what I wanna do is I wanna turn off everything except for this final scale so that I can see what I'm doing. So I grab everything, I click on my mouse wheel this time to bring up my options and then I'm gonna click the little ninja blindfold here that's gonna hide everything except for my scales, which we have inside there. So I've got my three different sets here, now all under control. I can make the first set the largest, the medium set, middle set medium, and the last set the smallest or infinitely small inside there as well. So you can see how this is quite a powerful tool because it allows us to scale each of our items individually as we're working. So this is how effectively you would use partitions and trees to split your items down. If you imagine you had a big surface and you had a lot of points along your surface and you wanted to deal with only specific points in the surface, this would allow you to 
break that first up into a tree, then break the branches down, and then do something specific to each one of those branches. You don't have to scale it. You could add a cube to each one of these points, a sphere to each one of these points, and a hexagonal prism to each one of these points. Doesn't matter, whatever you want. This just gives you the control in order to be able to split those items up and manipulate them as you want to. Now I wanna look at how we can use an image to transform what's happening over the top of our object. So if we have a gradient inside an image, how might that gradient affect what's going on in Grasshopper? Let's have a look. So I've got a surface in here. Let's bring that in, of course. So we've got surface, set one surface. There we go. And I'm just gonna turn that onto wireframe so I can see what I'm doing a little bit better there. Then we want to subdivide our surface. So we go back up into surface, utilities, divide. And this is gonna allow us to divide our surface. And of course, as we know from before, this is going to create points over the top. So I wanna control the number of points. I'm gonna go zero is to 50 is to 100. And this is our number slider for our U and V. I'm happy to use the same number for both. We've got a square here, so that will be fine. Then what I wanna do is I want to create some spheres where we have each of these points. So I could make a primitive sphere, but I want this to run quickly and I don't really care about them being uh, perfect spheres. So we can go ahead and use some mesh spheres in this case. So this is our points and that's gonna be the base of our spheres. And currently the radius is set at 10. So the size of each sphere is set to 10. Now, what we wanna do is use a image, something like this that we might have from Photoshop or wherever as a gradient to define the radius that we have here. So everywhere in towards the center where it got blacker, it would get larger or smaller, and everywhere to the white edge would be the opposite. So first thing we wanna do is go into params, input, and then we come down into our image sampler. This is going to take the UV coordinates from our image. So right click, go to image, and then I'm going to go to square gradient, if we double click inside this, we can see we've got a couple of options. So it's looking for zero to one and zero to one. And we remember that term reparameterize is how we convert things from zero to one. So before we do anything, we need to go back to our surface, right click and reparameterize. So now we know when it comes into here, they're going to be talking the same language. Zero to one from here will be zero to one in our image. Next thing we wanna do is define the target. So we can choose red channel, green channel, alpha, whatever we want. At the moment we're dealing with black and white, so color brightness is going to be most effective for us. We can now take the UV points from there and then plug that into the radius. And we'll see that that's actually looking quite small at the moment. So we're going to add a little bit of maths in here just to help us out a little bit. So we've got a basic expression. I'm just gonna change this to X times five. Okay, and then I'm gonna put this into our points in here, and there we go. We can see that a little bit more clearly inside there on top of our surface. So where we have white, we're getting a higher gradient, uh, sorry, radius of our spheres, and where we have black at the edges, we have pretty much no radius. And then we can increase the density of this, play around more with our U and V count over there, and that's going to effectively change the number of pixels or the number of spheres inside there, and that will change our radius. We can go back in and edit this and make it more like a times three or do whatever we want so our spheres aren't intersecting as much. We have control over that. Let's have a look at what happens if we change our image. So we go right click, image, and then I'm going to take a stormtrooper showing my true colors here. I wanna turn off my surface divide for a little while because it's getting in our way. Here we are. Now we have spheres for our storm trooper. We can increase the number of pixels we have here. I'm gonna make that out to 100. And then I'm gonna change this down to just times two for now. And we can see that that's actually getting quite a lot of detail inside there. So you can see how this would become a powerful tool if we're dealing with things like biomimicry or we're dealing with different surfaces that have a lot of complexity. 
we can turn those surfaces or materials or whatever it is into an abstract version of that using Grasshopper to deal with it purely as an image sample. Really powerful tool. All right, now let's have a look at how to use the box morph tool. And the box morph effectively allows us to take a geometry from Rhino and then push, pull, extrude, squish, do whatever we want to it using Grasshopper with, of course, a lot of variability. So first thing we need to do is bring our sphere in, go over to geometry, geometry, set one geometry, and that's going to be our sphere. Next thing we need to do is bring in a bounding box. So we go up to surface, primitive, and then bounding box. And then we can plug our geometry into that one there. And we can see if we zoom into Rhino that we've got a box around our little sphere that we've brought inside there. Next thing we wanna do is bring in a box morph. So we're gonna go over to transform, morph, box morph. And that's gonna sit there for now. Before we get to the morph, we need to give it a target box. So let's go ahead and make a box together. So go over to surfaces, primitive and domain box. Then let's add some number sliders in here. We'll go zero to 10 to 100. Make three of these and we'll plug these in. At the moment, our box is set in the same plane. It's overlapping our little sphere at the moment. So I just want to move that out of the way. And I do that by going set one plane. And I'm just going to do that over here by clicking all the way through, hold shift while I'm doing it. And then I can see that it's moved it a little bit further over and I can play around with the size of my box in here. All right, now that we have these, we need to connect a few parts together. So first thing we're going to do is add our geometry into here. Our box is going to go into the radius and our target is going to come from our box that we have over here. So now we see we have our sphere which was inside the bounding box and then the box morph is what's going on over here. So if I play around with this, you'll see that I'm taking my original geometry and I'm deforming it based on what happens inside this box morph here. So let's turn everything else off so we can just see the final product and the original sphere. So we play around with our X, Y, and Z, and we can see that that greatly impacts the final shape that we have here. And this could be a really powerful tool if you've created something quite complex as a, a singular geometry in Rhino, and you wanted to be able to edit a few of them to look a little bit different or change in a specific way along a certain axis, you'd be able to use the box morph tool to do that. All right, let's talk about how we might use list item or separation of information to do different things in Grasshopper. So first thing, let's add these geometries into Grasshopper. Geometry, geometry, and then this time I'm gonna select multiple geometries. I'm gonna grab all of them and press enter. And I can now see that geometry's got all of them stored in the one. So we're gonna have multiple files coming out of here. So we wanna be able to separate those out. Let's go over to set, list, and list item. This is going to be our list that we're playing with. And then we need a number slider so that we can choose each one. This one, the first one is always gonna be zero in Grasshopper. So we're gonna need a number slider zero to three. So zero, one, two, three. And then we plug that into the item. And we can see as we choose this item, zero is the first one, which is now green. Go over to the next one, the next one, and the next one. So now we can control each one of these based on what happens there. All right, well, let's go into surface, freeform, and extrude. I'm going to extrude the item that I choose. Okay, and then the direction, we're gonna need a vector. Go over to unit Z, plug that one in, and then let's make another slider to 100 go in there and we can scroll that up so now we can see even more clearly as we go through our list item here we can change which one is being extruded based on our choice where this gets more interesting is if we have a whole bunch of geometries like we would if we've done a surface division or we're dividing things down we have a whole mess of points inside what happens when we have all of that so First thing, let's go into Rhino and I'm gonna make an array of all of these. 
I want 10 in the x direction, 10 in the y direction, only one in the z direction, and then let's get our spacing right. And something like this. Yeah, pretty happy with that. Press enter to accept. And now let's go ahead and add all of these geometries into that one geometry tab. So we go back into here, right click, set multiple geometries. Now, if we click on here, we should see that they all get selected once we go back into there. All right, so of course we can go through our number index and we could just change that index to go all the way up to 100 or however many we have here. But let's have a look at something I've prepared earlier. So we've got a series now. So instead of playing with just one at a time, let's see what happens if we plug a series in instead. Ah, all of a sudden, we are now able to extrude in a pattern shape. So we can play with the amount of objects that are going to be extruded. We can play with how many gaps we have between each one that gets extruded. So if we only have one, obviously that's gonna take the very next one, so there'll be no gaps. If we have two, there'll be one gap between each and we get these lines. If we have three, it's gonna make a bit more of a geometric pattern and so on. So you can see how plugging in series into a list item like this is gonna make for some very interesting patterns over the top of our surfaces because we might have a wavy surface which we then use divide surface to create a whole bunch of points. Each one of those can be determined to be an item and then we can use a series to select a pattern of the items and then do something to that pattern of items, i.e. extrude, add a shape, do some connections, whatever we wanna do. So this is how list item and using list can be a very powerful tool to create some interesting geometries in Grasshopper. And if we come back to our list item, sometimes we're dealing with geometries where we don't want to exclude any. And of course, list item by default is always going to choose one or some. Even if we plug a series in, you would have noticed before that some of them are left out. So we've got some other options as well. So if we go up to list, we can do a split list is another good way to do this. So I'm just going to delete this one out. I'm going to do plug my geometries into here, my slider into there, and A is going to go into this one here. And I'm just going to copy these over. And B is going to go into this one here. And I'll change my extrusion on this one so you can see what's happening. So effectively what happens in a split list is that we don't leave anything out. This time we've got this portion of the list up to 24 is going to go through A through this gate and everything above 24 is going to go through B. So we can see that the list, everything above that initial 24 that we have down here is now being dealt with down there. And of course we can plug series into here or random into here so that we can say everything that comes up in the series or in the random goes to A and then everything else goes to B as well. And that way you're covered to make sure every part of your surface or all of the geometries that you've created are being dealt with in one way or another. And of course there's other list items to experiment with here too. Something else we can do to control the pattern of our geometry and what's going on is called the cull tool. So let's have a look at cull nth first. I'm gonna plug my geometries into there and a number into there, and then our extrusion is gonna come out of there so we can see what happens. So cull nth means that every of whatever number we insert is going to be excluded. So let's bring this down a little bit and we can see what happens, right? So if we go cull every second one, we see that every second row is now getting culled out. If we increase that up a little bit, we see that it creates some pretty interesting patterns and geometry. And it's another nice way to add a little bit of randomness into which geometries you're dealing with. And of course you could put this through a split list first so that all the ones that aren't being dealt with still get extruded in some way or have some action coming out of them. But effectively this gives us opportunity to create some patterns there. There's another one we can do as well, which is a cull pattern. Let's insert that one instead and see what happens. So we've got that one there and that goes through into our geometries. And this one is a little bit different. So inside here, let's see, set multiple Boolean. So at the moment we're going false, false, true, true. And if we have a look at our geometry over here, we've got false for the first row, false for the second row, and then true and true, and it continues going on like that. And we can manipulate this, we can play around with this. 
let's just make it true false true false just so you can see what's going on and we commit the changes and we can see it splits them out like that so culling patterns gives us a lot of opportunity to play around with patterns okay now we're going to look at what's called an attractor point so here we have a grid of circles and a point inside here is going to determine what happens to these circles so we can see as i pull this point around and this circle of radius of amplitude around it impacts the overall scale of the circles and this can produce some pretty powerful results and help us to create some pretty interesting and unique surfaces as well so let's have a look at how we're going to build an attractor point and we're going to start from scratch so let's go ahead and hide all of this and we'll build one together so first thing we need to do is build a rectangular grid. So let's go over to vector, then grid, then rectangular grid, and put that one down there. And then we're going to need some number sliders. So let's go from zero to 10 to 100. This is gonna give us our S, X, and our X, Y. And then we'll have another one running our E, X, and our E, Y going this way. And this is going to give us our grid. I'm going to go ahead and turn this up to, let's say, something like this. Okay, perfect. So this gives us our rectangular grid. Now what we want to do is, at all of the points on the grid, we want to add some circles. Also, we go up to primitive and circle, drag that on there. We're going to connect our points to our points. And we're going to copy one of these sliders to make our radius. And we see that we've got quite a lot of circles on here, which in itself creates a pretty interesting pattern inside here. So that's pretty cool too. We can play around with that as well, but that's not what we're doing right now. So let's just get it to a happy medium where we've got a little bit of a gap between each one. And I'm now going to hide my grid as well, just so I've got my circles in here. That's all I wanna play with right now. The next thing we wanna do is add our point in space inside here. So we just go back into Rhino, click single point, Add him inside somewhere in the middle there. And then of course we need to bring that into Grasshopper. So we go to point, right click, select one point, and we just grab our point inside there in Grasshopper. Then around that point, we want to add a circle that's gonna be our radius inside there. So we go back over to curve, primitive, circle, and then we're going to make a circle around that. Let's grab our number slider again. And this time we're gonna make this much bigger. Double click inside there. We're gonna change this number to 1000. Click yes and okay. And now we're gonna be able to make our circle much bigger. All right, so now we need to think about what we wanna do next. So we've got this circle and with inside the radius of that circle, as we get closer to the point, we want things to gradually get smaller. So we know that there's going to be something to do with the distance. Uh, we need to think about the, the minimum in terms of the distance and maximum and the division of that radius as we get closer to the point. So let's add each one of those in. So we've got distance inside here. Then we go to maths, utilities, minimum. And then we've got our operators for division here. First thing is we take our distance and we want the distance from our grid of circles to our big circle, so remember that that's going to be the defining element of our attractor point. Then we're going to take the distance from that center point and split it by the radius of our large circle. And then so that we can create a ratio, we're splitting our minimum from our influence radius, which we have back here as well, plugged into A and B. Now all that's left is to scale everything. So we go back up to transform, affine and scale and we're going to scale our grid of circles. We want to scale them by their center points and Grasshopper is smart enough to know if you just plug those into the center points, it's gonna take them each to their center point. And then we're gonna scale it by the factor which comes from back here. Okay, so if we turn everything off now, except for our final one, we'll see that relative to where we have our point here, and I'll turn our circle back on as well so we can see what we're doing. Wherever we have our point is now going to scale T 
the circles within that influence radius. And it's always going to be proportional to that influence radius as well, as we can see inside there. So we know what's going on here. We've got our grid of circles, which come from this grid point that we've created there. We've then got a point which corresponds to a circle, which is our big radius. Then the distance from the center point of that circle out to the edge point is being divided up here as a ratio so that when we scale it, we know that relative to how close we are to the center point here of the attractor, our items or our circles are going to get scaled. And so wherever we move our attractor point here in space is going to determine which circles fall within their big circle and therefore which ones are going to be scaled by that point. Okay, now let's have a look at how we can create some diagonal grid surfaces. So we can turn a interesting surface like this one here into something quite structural and architectural that could be built quite easily. And of course, completely editable in terms of its variability, in terms of its structure as well. So let's look at how to get there and we'll start from the beginning together. So we'll grab all of this, move it out of the way for now. I'm gonna hide it all. And then let's start from the beginning. Okay, so we have our surface here in Rhino course we go up to params surface set one surface and that's going to bring it in there for us next thing we need to do is divide our domain down so we go to maths domain divide domain squared we're going to plug our surface into this one and then we're going to need some number sliders in here I'm going to go 0 to 10 to 100 and I'm happy for this to do both in here for me I'm going to plug that down, can't quite see what's going on yet. First we need to subdivide the surface. We go up to surface, utilities and then iso trim and then we plug that one here into the domain and our surface goes into there. And we've looked at this one before as well so let's make it a little bit easier to see what we're doing. I'm going to internalize this data into Grasshopper so that I can move the surface out of the way that makes it a little bit easier and then I'm going to reduce the U count down to somewhere below 30 so we can see what's going on and effectively what we've done is we've divided our surface down into a bunch of panels along the surface inside there now in order to be able to create our pipes along here to create our structure that follows we need to first separate them out into one individual panel so that we can play with the vertices at that point. So we know how to separate things out. We need to create a list item. So we go into sets, maths, list item. We're going to bring our surface in. And then of course, we're gonna to need to tell it which one we want to deal with. So I'm just going to grab my slider from over here. And then let's choose one where we can see what we're doing. I want one round about here okay so we've got this one here you can see what's going on inside there so i'm going to turn preview off of this one and make it a little bit clearer to see what we're doing okay so now we have our one item specified in here the next thing we need to do is a debrep so we go up into surface analysis and then deconstruct brep there it is and let's plug our item in here and we can see we've got from our deconstructed brett, we've got the faces, the edges, and the vertices. Okay, from our deconstruct brett, I wanna be able to deal with just the diagonal because I want my pipes to go from diagonal to diagonal. So in order to do that, we need to create some more list items so that we can specify exactly which corners we want to deal with. So I'm going to copy my list item from over here. Whoop, copy it from over here. Then I'm going to take my vertices, the list item, and then I'm gonna change this number slider because remember we've only got four points here from zero to three. So zero, one, two, three is gonna give us four points to play with. Okay, so now if I change this around, have that selected, three, two, one, zero. So now I can identify each one of those points separately. Of course, I'm gonna need each one of those points. So let's go ahead and make three more copies of this here. So this one is going to be point 
2 because I want it to go diagonal. So we got 0 to 2. And then this one will be 1 and this one will be 3. Bring those across and we can see 1 and 3 are now getting those points in space. Okay, so we've got 0 to 2, 1 to 3. We know now that we're going to need to create some lines to connect those points together. So we go over to curve, primitive, line. We plug in this point here as A, this point here as B, and we can see already that we've got this line drawn in to connect the two. Let's copy that one down and do the same thing over here for our other side. And we now have an X going through both of those, which is perfect. Last thing we want to do, of course, is to add some pipes to that. So we go back over to surface, freeform, and pipe. And then I'm going to connect my curve inside there. So I can see it's now taking that curve from my line and creating a pipe around it. And I want to do another one inside there as well. I'm going to make a new number slider to set our radius. Radius is currently set to 1. So I'm just going to copy this one here and plug it into both of the radiuses because I want them to be the same. I'm going to set that down back to 1, but I've got that there later if I want to enlarge it. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is make sure that this goes over our whole surface. No point in having just one part of the surface. So here is what we do. We now need to disconnect this list item here. This is the part of our algorithm that's telling us to only deal with this part. So what we're going to do is very simply just bypass it. So we're going to take our ISO trim and pl plug it into the dbrep inside there. And then we can delete this list item here. And Grasshopper is smart enough to see that we mean all of this stuff here. So now we have everything that we wanted. Let's go ahead and turn off everything except for our pipes now. And we can see that we have our pipes in place here. Because we started off our divide with a slider, we can increase, even decrease the number of structural elements we have going across here. Make it as many or as few as we like. And of course, we have our radius down here as well, so we can increase the thickness of these, play around with that as well. Okay, so let's say we're looking at a surface like this one, and we've already looked at how to use a divide surface to create a number of points over the top of the surface. We've got a surface, surface divide, and then these are our number of points. We can change the U and the V, and it ultimately gives us some points in space, to which we can then add things like maybe some mesh spheres over the top of so that each one of these points will result in a sphere and then we can create some pretty interesting things like this well, it doesn't have to be a sphere we can add absolutely anything to those points but what happens if we did have a sphere but we didn't actually want every single point to have a sphere and we wanted the decision whether or not it had a sphere to be determined by its curvature so if there's lots of curvature, it has a sphere. Where there isn't any curvature, there's no sphere. Then we can set up things like this. So we take our curvature, our surface curvature, from surface analysis, surface curvature. We plug that into our divide surface. We've got our surface plugging in here. We then have our UV parameters as a tree plugging into our UV parameters there. We then pass this through and evaluate which comes from, of course, our evaluate script evaluate, which is inside there, sorry, math script evaluate. We then plug in a basic panel, which came from here. And all I've done is X times Y. That's then going to tell this expression here that whatever comes in as X, which is going to be the mean of our curvature, is going to be multiplied by y, which we have here on a number slider. So let's watch what happens when we plug this into our radius instead. All of a sudden, we have a lot more unique geometry. So now where we have the extremely steep curvature, we see that we have much, much bigger spheres. When the curvature gets quite soft or no curvature, which we can see here where it's flat, we end up with no spheres. So not only are we saying where we want spheres, we're also determining the radius or the size of the spheres relative to the curvature as well. So this is another way that we can play with algorithmic design to toggle on and off 
or how big or how frequent things are relative to what's going on. And you could swap this out for surface curvature, could be any anything else in terms of the surface analysis. And by the same token, you could do this with curves as well, through your curves analysis as well. Effectively, what we're doing is plotting points in space and then using the original object, i.e. a surface, a curve, whatever it might be, to determine what happens along its edge or surface. And that's how we use different variables to determine outputs for our surfaces. All right, now let's have a look at a technique called paneling. So let's say, for example, we've got a unique geometry which we've made in Rhino and a unique surface. And what we want to do is we want to take this unique geometry and we want to copy it in multiple iterations around this surface. So not only do we want to create a copy at each point, but we want it to be morphed as it wraps itself around the surface. So let's have a look at what that means. So if we preview this on, we can see that as we go around the surface, this original geometry scales itself to relative to where it's sitting on the surface. If we look at the back here, it's getting more stretched along this axis and at the front, it's getting stretched along the Z axis along there. So effectively what we've done is we've created a bounding box around our original geometry and then we're mapping that box over the top of our surface that we have here. So if you remember back to the previous technique where we talked about the box morph and we had the small sphere and we were able to adjust the dimensions of the box we were copying it into and then ultimately we had a warped sphere, the same thing's going. Instead of warping uh, one specific iteration, we're copying it the whole way around the surface. So let's go ahead and do this together. I'm going to just drag this down here and we're just gonna make an exact copy, a replica of what we see here and we'll follow along step by step. All right, so first thing we know what we need to do, we need to bring in the geometry and we need to bring in the surface as well. So let's bring both of those in now. So we've got a surface and our geometry. We know our geometry, set multiple geometries, it's gonna be both of those. And we know our surface, right click, set one surface is this one. We can see here that this one has been reparameterized, so we're going to do the same thing to make sure we get the same results inside there. The next thing we see here is a bounding box. So we go up into surface, primitive bounding box. That's going to bring this one in here, and we're connecting our geometry into that one. Next thing we see over here is a cross reference, which we remember from our sets, list, and cross reference. And the last one we can see along this path is the box morph itself. We go into transform, morph, and box morph to bring that one in there. We connect our geometry through the cross reference, out the other side, and into the geometry of the box morph. Now we've got a few more bits and pieces we need to add into this other side, but let's just connect up this bounding box into the reference point for the box morph inside there. And we can see on this one, it says union box, whereas at the moment we've got per object. So what that means is the box is going to create a reference box around each of the geometries that we have here because we've got multiple geometries set inside there. We don't actually want that, so we need to go and right click in there and union the box. So if we remember back to our Boolean tools, union means to join them together. And now we can see that we've got one big box going around everything there, which is great. Uh, B is connected into T there, and that's looking good. Okay, now let's do the other side of the equation, which is, of course, the surface. So we've got our surface here already, and we can see a divide domain square, which we've seen a few times before. Maths, domain, divide domain square. And we've got a few number sliders as well. Now, number sliders we've used many times, so I'm just going to go ahead and copy these over, and we can use the same integers that we've had before. In our divide domain squared, we've got u here, v here. We can see inside here it says empty domain parameter. So we need to set our domain. So we're going to go to set multiple domains. We've got 0 and 1. And that is it there to finish. Then we should be able to go back in manage domain collection. And we can see that that is inside there now 0 to 1. I'm going to click OK. That's all being connected. Last thing we need is a surface box, and I'll show you how to just bring in any 
component, whatever we want, just by double clicking inside the canvas. And we can see that S box is what we needed and it's brought it in. So we didn't need to go through the menu there. Now that we knew what, exactly what we wanted, we could just type it in by searching through the canvas. Connect this through here. And then the final one is on our last number slider through here. We then connect this back up through our cross reference. But before we do that, we can see that we've created some reference boxes over the top of our surface already. And this is just by the division that we've created of our surface, divide domain squared. And then the surface box is taking each of those divisions, 16 by six as we have at the moment. We can see if we decrease that, it's gonna decrease the number. If we increase that, it's gonna increase the number as well. Uh, and that's created a panel or a box in each one of those positions. It's kind of like the UV surface divide that we would use before, but this time we're creating boxes instead of just the panels over the top of the surface. Last thing we want to do is connect this into our cross reference, and then we will see what happens next. Okay, that takes a little bit of time to load, but we can see we now have all of the components of our geometry mapped over the top of our surface. So just to reiterate what we did there, we have a bounding box, which goes over the top of our original geometry. We had to union them together because if we didn't do that, it was treating them separately. Then we had to run through a cross reference. In fact, let's quickly take our cross reference out. We're gonna bypass this to show you what happens if we don't have a cross reference running through. Okay, and we can see this isn't plugging into anything now. Let's zoom out. Ah, all of a sudden, we've now only got the top part of our geometry being morphed around here, and only one iteration, this oblong that we have back here, of the box underneath. Now, cross-reference, if we remember back to our earlier video, was the one where we had one, two, three, four, five on one side, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on the other side, and cross-reference was col connecting every single dot together. So if we use cross-reference in a situation like this, what it's gonna tell Grasshopper is that we wanna use all units, and all units are going to be connected into the other units over the other side. So by using cross-reference before we go from our geometry to our box morph, it's going to tell Grasshopper to overrule this and place all of these geometries in all of these boxes that we've created. Let's plug this back in. And we can see now that everything is returned back to normal by using the cross reference into our box morph tool. So that marks the end of our videos for Grasshopper. And of course we challenge you to go out there and experiment play around with your surfaces, play around with the different outcomes you can create, and get really experimental with your architectural response. There is no right or wrong answer here, we just want you to make sure that you're having a go. At the end of the day, Rhino is the primary tool we're using, Grasshopper is just going to give us a little bit of extra fun, but the primary objective is that we're still dealing with our concepts, we're still trying to chase down an idea. We're still playing with the basics of Rhino. We're thinking about surfaces and screens and tiling and all those magical things. Grasshopper is just an extra additional tool to help us generate a little bit more complexity within that modeling. At the end of the day, what we're trying to achieve is the transition from that which is conceptual or digital into that which is one is to one real. We're looking for haptic dialogues, surfaces that we just have to touch. And that's what we're chasing this semester.